Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today on our second learning session hosted by Parked Up People's Economy and the Toronto Environmental Alliance. Uh, it's so good to have you all here. And we'll start with a quick Zoom overview. So you can press the mic button to mute or unmute yourself. And if you're joining us via phone, you can press a star six to mute or unmute yourself. And the number two button, which is the video, you can take yourself on and off camera. And uh, if your internet is glitchy, uh, we have noticed that sometimes taking yourself off camera helps, uh, but we'd love to see your faces if you'd like to share. Um, and number three, the participant tab, you can use that to raise your hand or lower your hand. And if you're joining us via phone, you can press star nine. Uh, and you can also rename yourself, which is very helpful for us uh, to call on you during our group discussions uh, with your name and your pro pronouns. And number Hello. four button, which is the chat box. You can press on the chat box to post uh, any comments or questions, which we can raise during our discussion. And we also use that as an opportunity. We have Heather and Mercedes, which, who would be helping us with some links um, and um, that would be sort of more information if you want to read up later on. Perfect, thank you. And we're so excited to have language interpretation also part of our program today. Um, and so if you are joining us and would like the Tibetan language interpreted, you can press on uh, the English button and he, on the interpretation button, which is like a globe icon, and then you can click on Tibetan to hear the Tibetan translation. Or if you want to access that via your phone, you can press star, star zero. Um, and at any point, if you'd like us to slow down, uh, please just give us a sign or uh, send a personal message to any of the organizers. We'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Mercedes. Uh, we'll move on to the community agreements. So usually before our community agreements, we do a land acknowledgement. However, uh, our speaker Joss will be doing that today. So I wanna quickly take the opportunity to say that as a Tibetan uh, who comes from stolen land and uh, being a stateless refugee for since the day I was born till I moved here, um, it's really, uh, a challenging space to be in and constantly navigating what it means to be on stolen land and coming from where I come from. So I uh, just want to say that I'm forever grateful to be here and I uh, would like to pay my respect to any of our elders of the past and present who may be here with us today, physically, mentally, and spiritually as well. Um, so quickly, um, I will go over the community agreements. We have an overview. The Parked Up People's Economy is dedicated to creating an environment that is equitable, diverse, and inclusive for all members of our neighborhood. Our meetings will intentionally build accessible and welcoming spaces for, all, uh, for people of all races, genders, classes, abilities, ages, cultures, religions, and sexualities. We will not tolerate harassment of any form, including but not limited to racism, classism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, or any other oppressive language and behavior. If you witness or experience any harassment of any form, please do inform a member of the organizing team. And we also have some community agreement guidelines. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory, but if you'd like me to explain, uh, further explain for any of them, please do let me know and I'll stop to explain. But for now, I'll read. So one diva, one mic, make space, take space, be mindful of time, my favorite, which is no one knows everything, but together we know a lot. Being aware of power and privilege, um, patience and respect for each other and yourself um, and confidentiality. Thank you. All right, so the agenda for today, we just finished our welcome and overview of the Zoom. Um, we are going over sort of the Parkdale Climate Justice Circle right after this. And then we'll uh, introduce our speaker for today, uh, our learning session, which is going to be around the writing relations framework. And we'll also make sure that we have some time for question and answers and uh, last bit of community updates and next steps. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right. So 
I know that this is our second session, but just to give you a brief uh, overview of the objectives of our partnership, our initiative really came together when we started looking at how can we accelerate climate justice uh, through community hubs and co-creation. And so the three main objectives that we've come through, come, um, come up with are one, building confidence and knowledge on climate solutions. Two, activating place-based priorities that link to climate action and being very intentional with who and where we work with. Three, developing and implementing local initiatives to advance climate, climate justice. And so with these objectives in mind, we came up with the project that we are part of today. And uh, I'd like to invite Michael to give us a little bit more background on how this project actually came about. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michael Polani. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I'm climate campaigner at Toronto Environmental Alliance. And uh, T has, has been a partner with um, Parkdale uh, at Park and Parkdale People's Economy for the last uh, year and a half working on the project that Chemi described. And it's really a project focused on supporting local climate justice action at the neighborhood level. And it's based on the the starting point that um, climate change and the climate crisis is disproportionately impacting certain communities, especially Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities, and that there's a real need to amplify the voices of these communities in environmental justice and climate action, and that the transition, transformation that is needed to prevent and address the climate crisis is, is very much a transition that is based on building justice and improving access to uh, basic human rights in our society. And so this project's very much, maybe you can go to the next slide, please, Chemi. Um, this project is very much about learning together um, about uh, local initiatives for climate justice um, and about supporting local initiatives uh, that are related to climate justice in Parkdale and in building capacity and building the voice of diverse residents to uh, take action for uh, climate justice. And we had a first uh, climate justice circle in February uh, where we started together to identify local priorities for climate justice action in Parkdale. And one of the there were a number of key priorities around better housing, better transit, um, and that were identified. But one of the key um, priorities from the community was really to learn ways to situate our climate justice work um, within uh, indigenous an indigenous framework, um, uh, and to uh, move towards uh, writing relations and learning more about uh, Indigenous uh, frameworks of, um, of being, of knowing, and of interacting with uh, Mother Earth. And so to that end, this we're really excited tonight to have Joss Two Crows with us and an opportunity to learn uh, more about uh, Indigenous ways of knowing. So I think I will turn it over to Joss at this point. Welcome, Joss. To everyone in this uh, digital circle, I say anin, say go, skana goa. I'm welcoming you all. I, I know that the Zoom setup makes us into a grid, but um, for my teachings of the digital bundle, which I'm embracing ever more in this uh, COVID reality, um, we are technically in a circle. So try to see that in your mind's eye. And in a lot of uh, what I'll be sharing today, I'll be calling in uh, that, that invitation and that invocation to, to feel, to sense from your mind's eye. Um, often the mind is referred to as that space where we rationalize, but in this context, I'm speaking about what we imagine and what we dream and that our senses uh, come through our, our mind's eye and that's a wide range and breadth of sensing, of course. Um, and that's also how we connect to our intuition and how we connect to our helpers and our guides. But before I get into more of that, 
I want to share. Uh, I want to share something. So we we have an understanding that the land acknowledgement is um, is something that is done not necessarily by Indigenous folks. Though for some time we did, we were asked to do uh, land acknowledgements as well as smudges. Um, but that that is an invitation to settler folks or folks who are not Indigenous from these lands to be able to acknowledge and recognize um, the lands that they're on. I am the Battlegrounds of Colonization. I'm a Great Lakes Métis or a Gichigami um, I'll introduce myself in my language. The Genichoga we young yats, Mashkikibi Moso in Indigenous cars, and the Kdodem, the Shkani Zibi, the Niawa Unegagai, Indigenous cars. Well, basically, what I said is my name, my spirit name is Two Crows Medicine Walker. In community, I'm known as Two crows. Uh, my given name in français is Jocelyn Tremblay, but uh, in English folks call me Joss. Um, I'm a beaver clan and uh, as I said I'm a Great Lakes Métis. I'm of mixed ancestries of Ganyangihaga, also known as Mohawk. You know, that's not how we would refer to ourselves. Um, a Wyandot, which are the descendants of the Wendat peoples. Um, I also have Anishinaabeg ancestries that are Parawatomi and Mi'kmaq. I have French or Muskrat French uh, from Southwestern Ontario and Ashkenazi ancestry. So I'm a hybrid like many people today. And so I carry ancestries and blood knowledge from across the big water and also from these lands. Um, primarily my indigenous ancestry is from the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, and I grew up, as I was referring to Dishkani Zibi, the Antlered River, um, the Footwaters, um, a creek referred to as the Indian Creek, which is the final tributary to what is also known as the Thames River. And so I grew up in that tiny wee tip of what we call the province of Ontario or Ondalio, um, which is an Onkwewinia word or a word in the language of the Longhouse people, also referred to as Iroquoian or the Iroquois, but we never called ourselves that either. Um, and I spent the first 20 years of my life with my Métis family there on the land. Um, I was very blessed to have had that experience to learn to hunt and to fish and to trap and to grow our traditional foods and medicines. Um, I am also, I should say, Wagi Unumwa, Wokichita Nish Manidu. I am a two spirit trans person. And so 20 years ago, I fled in a diaspora, among diasporas, to Toronto so that I might find some breathing room for myself. And I spent the last 20 years here in Dando, as we refer to it, from its Six Nations. Um, but I also located my homelands as being Niawa Onegagai, also known as Kobeche uh, Nongzibi, the so-called Humber River, which is my sanctuary, it is the Humber River watershed where I have been held uh, for the past 20 years. Um, I just want to share that the context by which I find myself here in this digital circle, um, I was approached when I work with Greenest City as the Indigenous cultural programmer and an earth worker. Um, I self-identify as an earth worker, though I have been, I have studied and worked as a farmer and a gardener um, and agroecologist, a permaculturist, a holistic gardener, etc. Um, and I found that the only way that I could really relate spiritually uh, was to see myself as working with the land. And an earth worker to me imbues that significance and that meaning. Um, I'm a traditional tribal seed keeper. I'm a pipe carrier. <laughs> I'm a multimedia artist and a community worker. And then all of those different distinctions. Um, probably it's also evident to some extent that I'm a storyteller and I'm a trickster uh, and I'm a grief worker. And I'll speak more to what I mean by that as a grief worker. Um, but as promised, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement, but I'd like to lean into the technologies of my indigenous teachings. Um, uh, for example, I lit a smudge um, first for myself to ground, and then I was sending it across the digital waves to all you folks in the digital circle. And it may seem interesting or curious to refer to that as a technology, but of course it is one of our technologies. I'm holding an eagle feather uh, as a talking piece to help me find my truth and to locate that breath 
and my voice. It's also a longstanding technology. I'm holding some asima or yengwa umwe or tobacco, traditional ceremonial tobacco, as direct connection to creation spirit. Came down with Sky Woman uh, and as a longstanding. Uh, practice for helping us to connect to the spirit energies that are among us so that we are not just speaking from our own place of truth, but the truth of our ancestors and also truth into futurity for those coming faces to make sure that we are speaking in right relations, uh, not just in a self-centered way. So I want to share something uh, that is an onkwe onwe practice. Again, onkwe onwe is how we refer to the longhouse people in our language. Um, and it's the words before all else, also known as the Thanksgiving Address or the Owendong Gariwate Gwen. Um, to me, this models writing relations and there's a lot of teachings in this. So I'm gonna give what I would call a fast and furious version as historically the Thanksgiving Address could last up to four days. And I have practiced um, the words before all else, that's important, um, up to two hours which is an incredible experience. Um, to preface, this is about extending greetings and gratitude to as many of our relatives as possible, not just our human ones, our more than and other than human ones. And so I will invite you all, again, to recognize in your mind's eye that we're in a circle together. And the power of that circle is also one of our indigenous technologies, that we are all equal uh, relative to uh, consensus about having moments and times where individuals are speaking. But the idea is that knowledge is not being authorized by one person over another, that we are all knowledge keepers in this circle, and that's why we're in this circle together. We are also always meant to recognize who is not in the circle, because the circle is meant to grow and, and grow and grow. So, and there's so many teachings to give about the circle. But in this Thanksgiving address, we are calling in recognition of as many relatives as possible to invite their spirits to be with us so that they can feel our gratitude. And this is a form of regenerative reciprocity, a writing relations with our relatives so that they know that we remember them, that by recognizing them and acknowledging them, we both receive the medicine of their continued existence and they receive through our recognition an empowerment so that they may continue to be here, ideally for seven generations to come and then some. <clears throat> so we're first gonna turn our attention to creation spirit, the great web of life, the inseparable all, that interplay, that interconnection that connects us into the past, across all of the present and well into the future. Uh, we refer in Okwomania as Shongwiati Sung Rawino, or in Anishinaabe Moen, Kichimanidu, great spirit. So to the great spirit, I say in the language, desno heradu, to which you can reply out loud or just in your heart, yo, or yo, 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 however you like. And that means that you ag agree that we are bringing our hearts and our minds together as one. So to Kichimanidu, shanguyati son rawino, desno heradu, yo. Wanting to keep our gazes up into the sky world, recognizing uh, that night moon or grandmother moon who has been very full and filling up no doubt the water pulling the tides up in our bodies pulling the tides up along every shoreline um, to that nighttime sun to the daytime sun to all the planets especially those ones that are in retrograde mars and venus pluto i think neptune's the other one they've they triangulate with us and they impact us from birth until we return to the earth. To all the star beings in our galaxy and well beyond into the multiverse, we send our greetings and our gratitude to the sky world. You. To the stratosphere, this is an important one, We're calling attention to the four winds. So recognizing that air element, the four winds that come from the four directions, which we know in the medicine wheel is east, south, west, and north. We call in the thunderers that bring the rains. So that's the water recognition. And we call in the animiki thunderbird that comes with the lightning, that charges the rains and brings that awesome energy to all the roots and the seeds. And that's a recognition of the fire. So to the four elements and to those relatives 
of the stratosphere. We send our greetings and our gratitude because we want the rains to come more often, more gently, less hard, less angrily, less enraged. To all those who carry in their minds, rain, rain, go away. Don't rain on our picnic. May we remember to be in a good, in a good way, in right relations with those thunder beings. And so to the stratosphere, we send our greetings and our gratitude. This no you. Turning our attention downward to this, our home, our oldest relative, the minerals, the rocks, this earth. This place that grounds us so we don't fly off in outer space has grounded us, again, from birth to death, every step of our lives, we can be assured that we are held by this place. To the divine feminine that we recognize clear across the Americas and all over this planet, the divine feminine in the Mother Earth. We send our greetings and our gratitude. So the other three elements wore down over millennia that mineral and made soil. And for that, we are very thankful. And soil is the home and birthplace of first life. And this is an interesting acknowledgement that I make as an earth worker, which is to the microorganisms, the invisible but everywhere. They make it possible for us to digest. They help us with our immune systems. They are miraculous little creatures and they have incredible teachings for us about change and transformation and how we compost things that are seemingly nasty into wondrous, life-giving, regenerative power. And so to the microorganisms, we send our greetings and our gratitude. To the plant world, this is a big one. They provide us food and medicine, clothing, shelter, and they've taught us so, so, so much from the tiniest, micro blue green algae to the tallest trees you can imagine whichever those are every tree you've ever hugged every tree you've ever sat beneath for shade um, those food plants and i think of uh, johequa or sustenance or the three sisters uh, mandamen miskodijabek onslagoa gosaman gosaheda oneste all those foods and those medicines we want to really call them all in again we're doing this all together we bring our hearts and our minds together as one to the plant world we send our greetings and our gratitude to the winged ones or the ones of the wind uh, from migize eagle to chogawe crow um, to mang loon think of how those relatives show us when the thunderers are coming in they come ahead of those storms they gift us with their feathers to help us again find our truths and help us communicate and they teach us about how we move wind through <clears throat> they also gift us with their song and so much more to the winged ones we send our greetings and our gratitude to the water world ones so the finned and web-footed ones so i'm thinking about gogong fish and i'm thinking about mekina turtle and i'm thinking about my clan amik beaver to all those ones that too teach us about the flows and the currents of that element. Uh, they also teach us when the water is not healthy, when it's not clean to drink. They also clean it through their bodies. Uh, for these and so many more reasons, we send our greetings and our gratitude to the water world ones. I make a special acknowledgement here from the, my own two spirit medicines and as an Ashkimadzig, a person of Métisage, which is to recognize the world bridger. So beaver is both of water and of earth. Uh, turtle too is water and earth. There are those birds that are divers and also flyers. Uh, to all the relatives that straddle ecotones and ecosystems and teach us how to connect across environments and spaces. Uh, teach us that there's a lot more movement than sometimes we are led to believe that is a very special repository of knowledge to, to call in the world bridgers. And so to those, the world bridgers, we send our greetings and our gratitude. Yo, moving into the four-legged ones, actually, I need to call in the tiniest multi-legged winged and mandibled ones. Uh, they help to spread seeds and pollinate. They get stigmatized as bugs, um, but of course they like in a, in a similar way that weeds get stigmatized as a pest or as a nuisance, uh, there is no relative that is, that is a pest or a nuisance, except for maybe humans. That's uh, 
a whole other discussion, but to the insects, maybe they stigmatize them. They're indicators of a healthy or an unhealthy ecosystem, and they are always doing important work, no matter where and how they show up. So to the insect world, we send our greetings and our gratitude. This no hirabi. Yo. So now to the four-legged ones, I like to say from moose to mouse, all those relatives that you have known from your dog to your cat and your hamster, uh, to Mayangan wolf or Makwa bear, all those four-legged animals that have um, not just fed us and not just shown us how to move on the land. They've shown us how to relate to plants and medicines. They've shown us how to relate to other animals and to one another as we are also animals. Um, the, animal, the animal world is also a, a huge uh, realm to imagine. So we, every one of you imagining those four-legged ones is helping to send that good intention out to those four-legged ones. So to all the four-legged relatives, we send our greetings and our gratitude. Yo. And last but not least, and this is an important teaching, the two-legged animals. We are the youngest of all the relatives, which teaches us that we have always needed all of the other relatives wherein they have never needed us. We have a very special responsibility as as human people, which is to maintain a balance as stewards on the land, and we do so through ceremony that we are not meant to speak for any other relative, but to receive through our ceremonies, insights and vision for how to be in right relations with them. And so I call that invocation that we all remember and continue to practice our ceremonies however we can, and to know that from the land, from the water, from the air, from the earth, we can receive teachings and practices to continue to grow our ceremonies in culturally appropriate ways. <clears throat> to the two-legged ones. And I want to call in the inherited traditional peoples of these lands whose ancestors' bones are buried here, the Wendat people and their descendants, the Wyandotte and the Wendage. I want to recognize all those other Onkwenwe people who were dispersed and erased, the Petun, the Erie, the Neutral, the Tobacco, and then some. I want to recognize the Haudenosaunee, which are the Six Nations, the Mohawk, Seneca, Oneida, Onondaga, Tuscarora, and Cayuga. I want to recognize all the Algonquian peoples, the Algonquin themselves, and the Anishinaabe, the Three League Fire, which includes the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Parotomi. I want to recognize the Nehea Cree. I want to recognize Delaware Lenape, Blackfoot, Soto, Chippewa. I want to recognize the Wabanaki Confederacy of the Abenaki, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet peoples, and so many more peoples who came through here. And I just call to our attention the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, which was an agreement that was in fact between 50 plus nations, some from six, say it was 80 plus nations. The Mohawk are but one nation among those many nations. So we know that many people came through these lands and shared these lands peaceably and honorably. Um, to all those peoples that I have named and those that we struggle to remember or recognize in language due to cultural genocide and genocide period, we send our greetings and our gratitude to the two-legged peoples. Desno Herado. Yo. Jimmy Gwich now Gua Tishame for holding a circle with me. And again, for bringing your hearts and your minds together as one. When we do this, we amplify these intentions. So my own intentions are very powerful and they will help me to shake off my own lived experiences of trauma and grief and my vicarious grief and my intergenerational grief, which weighs, weighs so heavily that it becomes difficult to see the path in front of me. To then, then it is very difficult to see my relationships and my responsibilities to those relationships. So Unque Unque pe people practice the Thanksgiving address again, the words before all else that's important. So if a smudge is important, you practice a Thanksgiving address. If this session is important, Thanksgiving address. If a ceremony is important, Thanksgiving address. It gives us a lot of teachings, which I'll be touching more on. Um, but I, I thought, rather, I felt best way to teach is through storytelling and modeling. And so I hope that that resonated for folks a little bit. <clears throat> 
I feel to echo something that was said earlier, and I'm not recalling who it was who mentioned it, but it was with regards to stolen lands. And I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to actually extend an appreciation for, for saying that, because I know that it, okay, yeah, good, good. <laughs> um, it, it is a hard thing to say and to hear, to be on, upon stolen lands. Um, it is certainly recognized by uh, Onkwelling folks from Six Nations that these are unceded lands. And by that, I mean, again, to speak to the District 1's Blue Wampum, um, an agreement between so many nations of peoples on these lands long before settler folks came here. Um, recent treaty conversations, which were super interesting, um, brought up the question, which is that, or yeah, a question, are settler folks subject to the wampum agreements if they weren't here for the wampum agreements, or if they were never a part of the reconvening to polish, is a, is a way that we put it, to polish the belts, to keep them alive. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting question. I think that if people have come upon these lands which are subject to a wampum, then everyone is subject to that wampum, but that the responsibility is to support the indigenous people in coming together to polish that wampum. Now, the treaties of these lands, I have this shared on a document, which I'm gonna ask someone to post, which is labeled as stats. I apologize, uh, as I was trying to get on Zoom, my laptop, Zoom crashed. So I'm on my iPad and I am very limited in my ability to see. Okay, it's coming up. I also wanted to share that my preferred pronouns are they, them, by the way. So, okay, so at the top of this, some key points to consider, just a few things, there's a few things that'll go through, but I just wanted to share that um, wampum, wampum and treaties of this region, and this is but a few, this is just but a few, um, the dish with one spoon is, was hundreds of years in making before the first colonizer or settler folks came here. Um, the Turo wampum, <coughs> It was a wampum that was convened between early settler folks and was was polished by uh, settler folks or colonial states for some time, but it has been a minute since that wampum has been polished. Um, but as, in terms of treaties, which are a, a, a modern construction, treaties are something that were created by colonizers, ultimately uh, taking up the threat, the techniques, so to speak, of the wampum, but not practicing the ceremony or the actual culturally appropriate practices, but using language enough so to suggest that land was being, in, was being held in some kind of agreement. Now, of course, we now understand that treaties were only being used to grab land, and this is why referring to stolen land is so important. Um, given that the Dish With One Spoon had 50 plus nations, if the Mississaugas of New Credit were the only nation that signed a blank document referred to as the Toronto Purchase, then it was not a valid treaty because it did not actually have all of the nations subject to these lands included in it. This is why we consider these lands still unceded, which is very interesting. Now, beyond um, Treaty 13, which is what they refer to the Toronto Purchase as of having equated to Treaty 13, there are many other treaties that these lands are subject to. These are, again, just a few. The Treaty of Fort Niagara, which did also have 50 plus nations, the Jays Treaty and Haldeman's Treaty, etc. Nanfran Treaty is a really interesting treaty to look into. Um, elders from six and the clan mothers from six nations, the reserve in the Onkwilma Reserve in Oshwikin, near Brantford, um, they really uphold the Nanfran because the Nanfran Treaty actually more contemporarily upholds much of what was agreed at Fort Niagara, which was a treaty between 50 plus indigenous nations as well as Britain or representatives of Britain. So it's more appropriate than other treaties as it wherein actually representation was appropriate. I just wanted to touch on that briefly before I segue into some more information. Thanks again, Mercedes, for putting this stuff up. I wanted, I wanted to give people you know, some cues so they can do their own journeying into this information because I think actually by bringing up the treaties, 
And what I'll be coming back to is that we are all treaty people, um, even if, in fact, we have relied on a belief that the state is the primary treaty partner with Indigenous people. <clears throat> the state has not upheld its roles and responsibilities to Indigenous people for a really long time, if potentially ever. And so to understand that we do have some relationship to these treaties, because we're here, and this for me is also very interesting, how am I taking up responsibility as a treaty person, both as a person with Indigenous ancestry and settler ancestries? That's a really important question. Yes, Opal. And that reminds me, in seeing Opal Sparks' name, I just like to recognize my elders who support, encourage, and teach me. I want to recognize Opal. I want to recognize Donna Paulus, who's a seated faith keeper from Six Nations. I want to recognize Catherine Tomorrow, also a seated faith keeper of the Wyandotte Nation, to whom I'm related. I want to recognize Blue or Laureen Blue Waters, his grandmother who traveled with the missing murdered Indigenous women girls 2S Indigenous Trans Plus inquiry and contributed greatly to the report. I want to recognize Minnie Shikabe, a foremost Two-Spirit elder across Canada, <clears throat> and extend also my greetings and my gratitude for all that they have shared with me. I want to turn your attention to this interesting little section which is Indigenous people and some percentages. Bear with me on this because of course this is, it's painful, for me it's painful to look at this. Um, but often people in the colonized mindset respond better to stats and facts. And so I wanted to share this upfront, both disclosing my feelings about it and also just to open up some considerations. So as it says here, Indigenous people make up 24% just slightly more than 24%, but less than 25% of the global population today. <clears throat> Having said that, this figure, which is still under contestation, over 80% of the biodiversity on the planet is stewarded by Indigenous people. In Canada, this is a really interesting piece, in Canada, land held by reserves, in Canada, we refer to them as reserves, in the US, they refer to them as reservations. The land that was essentially given, but the land that Indigenous people were pushed to, usually marginal, uh, not, uh, not arable land, not land good for agricultural practices, not land big enough to actually host a herd of animals or a flock or even a school of fish, um, and also almost always predominantly surrounded by industry, where they are then poisoned. <clears throat> and so in Canada, this, this is not a mistake or a typo. All the land that the government, that the state issued to Indigenous people through the reserve system makes up only 0.01%. More recently, or not that long ago, rather, like in the past decade, that figure was 0.02, and it was more recently contested to be, in fact, 0.01. <clears throat> and I just want to, I did this little drawing, okay? This outer circle is one Navajo reservation in the United States. And this circle within it is a Hopi reservation that's inside that one Navajo reservation. And inside of that Hopi reservation is all of Canada's reserved lands combined. And it, it doesn't even actually fill that one Hopi reservation. It slightly more than half fills it. Just, just to be clear, all of Canada's reserved lands combined cannot fill that one Hopi reservation that is inside of a Navajo reservation. So very different strategies by the state to <clears throat> displace peoples and control what kind of access they have to land and to water. Uh, what this spells out is that Canada's indigenous peoples have been given very limited land by which to survive in their cultural ways or through their customs. Again, that pretty much broke the ability to continue to hunt or to fish or to grow our tribal foods. Those practices were taken from us. And in many ways, we've been stereotyped and stigmatized uh, for practicing those things, that that is uh, debased intelligence to sustain ourselves in those ways. As a result, this final statistic is that over 50% of Indigenous peoples in Canada have been displaced to urban centers. <clears throat> Unfortunately, thanks to systemic racism, 
indigenous peoples in the cities more often than not are living in low income housing developments which have little to no green space they're concrete steel and glass squished together very little space <clears throat> this is, greatly contradicts their historical ways of being on the land it also very much limits their ability to have a freedom of movement which is something that is very intr intrinsic to their spirits it's within their blood memory to be able to move with the seasons to be able to move across the land certainly not in a straight line but either way to do so and we can't do that now because of property and the construct of property <clears throat> i'm going to come back to that because i think that talking about property is really really important um, i'm just going to move down this list a little bit more i just want to i just want to put these some ideas out there and i know you folks um through the parkdale people's economy and toronto environmental alliance you have surely talked about from just what you've shared already you're, you're on the decolonization tip there's an understanding that we're meant to be unpacking uprooting the ways in which colonization have essentially infected our mind and our hearts so that we can imagine other ways of being and I imagine too from some of what you've shared that you've also been considering or been in some kind of conversation around re-indigenization and there's different interpretations about whether those happen simultaneously parallel or one has to happen for the other and I'm, I'm not going to answer that question for folks, but I think it's really important that wherever we're talking about decolonization, we are simultaneously engaging in a conversation about re-indigenization just so that we don't leave one behind. Um, I think, or rather, I feel to say that from my, from my knowledge, from my experience within Indigenous community, um, which is my whole lifetime, that the colonial mindset is a paradigm. It's a way of thinking about how we are in the world. It's inseparable from capitalism, seemingly, and thusly the construct of property and gaining wealth from exploiting the land. That property and all capital is built upon exploiting the land, and the waters and the air. <clears throat> Reindigenization is about reconnecting to place. It's about supporting any relative, not just the human indigenous relatives. And this is a, a really important thing that I want to convey because this is something that often gets left out. And it's because of the colonial mindset that we would hear or see a term such as re-indigenization and perceive it to be about the human people, the indigenous human people, those First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. But it's not exclusively. It's as much, if not in many ways, more so about all those other indigenous relatives, the animals, the birds, even the stones, the minerals, the waters themselves, that they are of the place and they need to be re-indigenized and supported to be here as much so as the human people. I just wanted to plant that seed. <clears throat> On this next, this next tip, because I think that, I, or rather, I interpret that uh, folks, have been deeply in conversation about global warming and climate change. That's what you're here for. That's what you're about. And I also heard reference to the significance of the impacts of climate change, global warming, the disproportionate impacts on racialized folks, on Black, Indigenous, and folks of color. And <clears throat> there is more than enough evidence to see that this is true from the scientific world and from those communities themselves who can attest to the violence they're experiencing. Uh, both, uh, both due to environmental impacts and, of course, due to social organizing. And I want—I just wanted to speak to something within that, which specifically <clears throat> has to do with loss of biodiversity. So, species ex extinction is not new, but it is something that comes; it is pending with climate change is the loss, the ongoing loss, the rapidly amping up loss of biodiversity. <clears throat> Species extinction, again, is not new. We've experienced ecocide here on these lands more than once. Um, I feel to share, I'm going to share a story. I'm going to restory these very lands. So <clears throat> one of the earliest writings from a surveyor, a colonial surveyor who came to this region wrote that a squirrel 
could go from the eastern shores of Lake Ontario all the way down to the Detroit River without ever having to set foot on the ground. <clears throat> now, southwestern Ontario looks like the prairies. The great woodlands, which people speak about in a very romantic way, the woodland era that is depicted in, in our traditional art, <clears throat> is seen to be ahistorical. It's, it's in the past. But of course, the spirits of all those relatives, the woodlands that were raised, are still with us. That hauntedness is still with us. But of course, that wasn't the only eco side. The Great Lakes were surrounded by great wetlands. And now there is but the tiniest fraction of the wetlands that used to be here. They were thought of as wastelands. So they were, they were dug up, they were buried, etc. And that too was a great, great loss of species and biodiversity. <clears throat> For me, as I was saying earlier, as an earth worker, to put my hands in the soil here is to feel a grief that has been piling, to feel the dishonorable harvest that so many relatives were taken without any consensus. And that often when I share that as a, as a notion that the trees weren't asked if they could be harvested, that those wetlands and all the relatives within them, all those medicines, etc., were not asked if they could be harvested. And I've seen when I work in community, even within indigenous First Nations, Métis, Inuit community, what I call the colonized mindset squirm. It doesn't quite make sense what I'm suggesting. I give this teaching, especially if there's kiddos around. So if I was walking down the street and I met this person for the first time, if I just walked up and pulled their hat off their head just because I liked it, a kiddo would say, I would ask, how would you feel about that? And the kiddo would say, no, that's not what you do, right? But that, for, for whatever reason, that no longer, well, for a number of reasons, that no longer seems to apply between humans and all our other relatives. So we walk up and pull the branches off of a cedar. We'll walk up and pull a carrot out of the ground because we feel entitled to it. Well, I planted the seed or this tree is just here. What's the big deal? <laughs> Honorable harvest is a very long standing practice and it's actually directly related to this practice too of holding sema, that when we, are receiving knowledge from an elder or knowledge keeper, we give them sema to honor that we've just harvested something that's nourishing us. And so the same practice should be expected or should be honored, should be observed with any other relative, including a stone or a feather that we pick up on the ground. We have a teaching <clears throat> that rather than we were drawn to that feather or that stone, that actually the feather or that stone was drawn to us and called our attention. And that to honor that relationship as we would between human people. When I meet someone for the first time, generally we have a practice where we exchange names. We recognize one another. Hi, this is my name. What's your name? And then we've begun a relationship. But it's only a relationship if we keep coming back to it. If I consider someone my friend and I never check in on them, I'm not a very good friend. The idea is that I keep showing up. And if I see that my friend is looking <sighs> droopy, looking um, just worse for worse. I'm gonna lean in. I'm going to extend my sensing self, my emotional self. I'll make myself emotionally available and be present with them and offer water to hydrate them just as I would a plant in any giddy gunning or growing space that I'm tending to. And I'll keep coming back and I'll keep coming back and I'll keep coming back. And I give this teaching about harvesting that I think that unless you feel a very strong call from that relative that when you first meet a relative that's not the time to harvest it especially when we're wild crafting or foraging out and about it's really important to spend some time with a relative first and to actually form a relationship to witness it and that doesn't need to happen with a, a language certainly not a colonized tongue that we can experience that by our spirits not kids they don't mind going up to the cedar tree and saying hi my name is blah 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 is it okay if I harvest you? I really want to use your medicine to heal my grandmother. I really want to use your medicine for a smudge, la, 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 Most important teaching in that is to ask for permission to listen so that we can honor consent. And that's something that we really need as a both a decolonizing and a re-indigenizing practice in all of our relationships. <clears throat> this teaching that I've just given is has been more recently coined as regenerative reciprocity and i've shared that up in this link here um robin wall kimmer is a potawatomi niji um, down in new york state 
who's also learned a lot from Onkwiome folks. She's been in ceremony with those Haudenosaunee down there. And she wrote this great book called Braiding Sweetgrass. And I wrote it here just so that you can have that cue, that prompt to go and look for any of her work. But this is one of her gifts to community uh, translated in English. Regenerative reciprocity is about relationships. So reciprocity is having a relationship. And a regenerative one is ideally that in both re like relationalities, there is some form of nourishment, some form of sustenance that one relative is not gaining more than the other. That is an imbalanced relationship. So trying to imagine how many in every day, how many relationships we have to stuff. I think on, for example, this copper cup, which is a ceremonial object as part of my bundle. And it's also a mineral, one of our oldest relatives. Now, can I, can I say that I had a regenerative reciprocity from its harvest? No, I can't, I can't. Can I hope that through ceremony and honoring it, not just using it, not just using it because I feel entitled to it, but honoring this relative when I use it in my ceremony, that I can restore that sacred connection? That's a teaching that I carry forward as a way. Likewise, for all the stones or the feathers that we've picked up already, we can still practice ceremony to honor them. Even if we didn't have that honorable or harvest teaching yet, it's not too late to recognize the gifts and the medicines that they give us. <clears throat> I go on then to this point underneath regenerative reciprocity, which is also a concept that came from another Nish Nishnabe Moen, or rather another Nishnabe Kwe, Leanne Beresamasoke Simpson, who's from these lands or from the Peterborough area and has written all kinds of incredible things, including this great book. I really recommend it. But she wrote this very accessible article called Land as Pedagogy, which is a mouthful, but she translates it or she goes on further to explain that land is our teacher. Pedagogy is a way of learning. <clears throat> that the land is self-evident, that the land, if we spend time observing it and witnessing it, shows both how the water has moved along it and it shows too how humans have disturbed it. And we, there are many ways that we can learn from the land if we open our hearts and our minds to that possibility. And I, given I only have so much time, I'm gonna give my, do a little time check here on this. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I'm just planting seeds here. Another concept that I really wanted to share because it came forward in my conversations with Mercedes and trying to imagine, what am I gonna share here? Because there's a lot I could share. There's a lot I could share. Restoring is a really powerful concept. So I want to give, it's really important to me, and it's a, it's a teaching and a really critical practice where we acknowledge where our teachings come from. For me, as a two-spirit person and as a trans person, I really want to recognize Coley Drissel, who is a 2S trans Cherokee person from south of the medicine line, aka in the United States. And restoring is a kind of reformation of these four concepts. So restoration or eco-restoration, loosely plays on this idea that it's possible to restore things to the way they once were. Now, I don't actually personally believe that that's possible, but that's another conversation. It's also obviously talking about storytelling, which is honoring our oral traditions and how important it is for us to, to reclaim ways of knowing that aren't all about the written form or the written word and authorizing knowledge by text. <clears throat> Retelling, is another really interesting concept. Now we've had so much of our stories coded through colonial means. So for example, both Medewin spiritual practices of Anishinaabe people and the longhouse practices of Onkwe'ome people were coded through Judeo-Christianity. If they were going to be allowed to survive, they needed to essentially become Christianized. And so we're at a time now where we're having to decode them. We're having to decolonize, for example, we didn't wear ribbon shirts and ribbon skirts. That wasn't a thing for us traditionally. That's a modern notion. And we were never expected to have to choose which side of the lodge or longhouse that we had to be on based on wearing a ribbon shirt or a ribbon skirt, or more importantly, what sex we were born with. Our gender and our sex is a much broader concept. It's a cosmology of understanding actually. And that clear across the Americas, in fact, all of the major language groups of Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples, had multiple terms to speak about the spectrum of gender. They were not so limited 
by just masculine and feminine. And in fact, a really important understanding is that, right? That when you are born from a place of indigenous knowledge, you are not born empty as we are in Western colonial thought. That a baby needs to have all this information shoved down its throat and it needs to learn to record and regurgitate as quickly as possible. For us, you're born with your birthrights, your ancestries, your helpers and your guides, they're walking with you. And it is our responsibility to assure that a baby doesn't walk off a cliff, but that we are encouraging them, prompting them to seek their own gifts and their own medicine. So if a kiddo was drawn to skunk, it, we, we would definitely want to teach them how to do that safely. But we recognize that that's a medicine that's going to come into the service of our community as community workers are thinking from a communitarian perspective rather than an individualistic capitalist perspective. <clears throat> so this retelling is really important because it's a way for Indigenous peoples to continue to survive our culture by, by having that, that sense of empowerment to rock our colors, <clears throat> to sing our songs. And by doing so and doing so and doing so, we are, we are revealing more and more truths within that. And the recentering is a specifically two-spirit piece that again, because of Judeo-Christianity, our two-spirit indigenous queer and indigenous trans peoples were not just pushed out, they were wholesale, like they were wiped out because they were our medicine people. They were power people, just as our clan mothers were debased and removed from their roles and responsibilities, thanks to patriarchy, to break the systems of self-governance that indigenous people had was a way to displace our ability to self-govern. And not being able to self-govern has been, well, wholly detrimental. And it's one of the main things that indigenous people continue to insist to ask for, is to, is to be able to practice their own self-governance. To do so, though, requires retelling of the practices that we had. And we're only retelling what has survived colonization. But the more we tell it, the more is revealed. So this restoring is a really important concept. And I love to share it. And I hope that you will all share it and to recognize, again, that this is about bringing people back into the circle, those who have been pushed out, that in nature, the, the kind of medicines that two-spirit people and trans people carry is so self-evident. We see all kinds of queerish ways in the natural world, in fact, just as I would say that the natural world is so, so, so far from a monoculture. But we go outside of the city and we see that the lands which are romanticized, these pastoral farmlands, they're all monocultures. As far as the eye can see, you just see genetically modified Roundup ready corn or beans, soybeans <coughs> or wheat. And that's the furthest from anything natural. It's actually such an unhealthy environment that it can only be sustained by ever-growing season by season and greater inputs of petrol and chemical products that are throwing the water, the land, the land health out of balance to such an extent. <laughs> I love you, Opal. <laughs> and this does actually lead very nicely into this final point on here, which is about rewilding. And I kind of put it as a question and an exclamation point. Um, for me, rewilding is a really important concept and I, I'm certainly not the first uh, to carry this forward, though it's been a, a solid 15 years that I have, the first song that I ever conjured that ever came to me uh, was a song about rewilding. And that for me, <clears throat> what is wild is so very misunderstood and elusive and precious. Um, nature gets framed as like everything that isn't human, everything other than human. And yet, when I look around the city and I, I see nature, for sure, I go to parks and there's nature there. There's trees and there's grass and there's insects and it's a manufactured landscape. All that Kentucky blue grass was not meant to be there. It's probably the most colonizing plant that is in this part of the world. Uh, the trees were selected. Somebody decided who got to stay and who had to go. <clears throat> one of the decisions that's often made is that female trees or trees that are of so-called female trees are seen to be too messy. So they have been selected out of the landscape. And that's a really interesting thing to consider, actually. <clears throat> what is wild? Well, I'm feeling so many things. I'm, I'm holding this seminar. I'm having all these presences like relations and spirits behind me saying speak to this and speak to that <clears throat> I 
I personally believe that one of the number one projects within colonization was to separate humans from what is wild, not just the natural world. That Judeo-Christianity taught us that to be close to the land is evil, that it's dirty, that it's a lesser than intelligence. And so for so many years now, we've been encouraged to step away from the land, to turn our backs from the land. And in so doing, we don't notice or become complicit with what is happening in the agricultural lands, in the mines, in the fracking and oil rigs, etc. What's happening in the oceans, what's happening in every corner of our planet, which is just the desecration of the natural world. And it's the effort or the attempt to extinguish that which is wild, the wildness within us too. <clears throat> I wanted to, I wanted specifically actually to, I'm just gonna look at this link here again. Would you actually be willing to just scroll down a little bit on that link? Or rather scroll back up? I, was, I wanted to center on under decolonization, decolonization and re-indigenization, there's a point about cultural genocide and self-determination. Thank you for circling it, you're doing great. <clears throat> so, I'm calling attention to cultural genocide and I sh there should be a link shared. There's a bunch of links that are shared actually. Um, there's six links, different, different views uh, from across the planet um, talking about biodiversity and indigenous stewardship. So as is already suggested here, if 80 plus percent of the, land, the global biodiversity is stewarded by indigenous people, uh, they came to that with a uh, concerted effort. Lots of science has been looking into where is biodiversity being held? And it actually has little to do with the size or scale of those spaces. It has everything to do with the practices. <clears throat> is it just a coincidence? Surely not that indigenous peoples, those who are of the place connected to it, connected to it inseparably through their ceremony, connected to it inseparably through right relations, now, I brought forward this concept of writing relations because right relations is, is too static. Writing relations is about an active engagement that we are constantly doing it. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a link that I shared. Uh, there's two links actually that are really significant on top of a series that talk about biodiversity and indigenous land stewardship, just so that you can inform yourselves. I don't need to go through it all. There's, there's just multiple different viewpoints coming from Australia, coming from also from the UN, again, where they're recognizing actually both that climate change is, again, disproportionately impacting indigenous people whilst they're simultaneously holding most biodiversity on the planet. So it's critically urgent to support indigenous people to protect their lands and to do so in a way that allows them to self-determine. Because if we do it for them, then again, we're just practicing that colonial mindset, nothing for indigenous people without them. It has to be done with them. And that is to resource them to come into the circle, to in fact be at the center of the circle because they clearly know how to protect the land. They know how to steward it. All climate change efforts, the UN has more recently made a declaration that all climate change efforts should be centering indigenous peoples. And that's, it's really, really, really important to catch this piece about self-determination because if indigenous peoples can't determine for themselves, then we are continuing to perpetuate cultural genocide. And cultural genocide is not just about dispossession of land or ongoing displacement from land. It's not barring them from practice, just barring them from practicing their languages or even being able to be seen in public smudging because 10 years ago, less than that, my own community on the river were too afraid to be seen because if we were even smoking three or more of us rocking our colors, the cops would be called. And that fear, that anxiety of having, even whether it's that police violence or just having your neighbors give you dirty looks or say stuff to you when you're trying to do ceremony makes it impossible to sink in. It makes it impossible to ascend and to really be able to connect to the spirits that are there and that are trying to give us those messages. So how can I protect the Anoptic maple trees that are so quintessentially important to this specific landscape? And I could talk for hours just about that relative alone on these lands. How can I care for and protect that relative if I don't connect to its spirit, if I can't connect to it through that ceremony. 
it's just an example. So cultural genocide was a term that was brought forward specifically through the report on the inquiry into missing murdered Indigenous women, girls, Two-Spirit and Indigenous trans peoples. Now, originally, when the inquiry started, it was about missing murdered Indigenous women. And as they went across the nation state of Canada, they began to realize that it was not just women who were being impacted. It was also girls, Two-Spirit people and trans Indigenous people. But what really, what that report really shows us is that any relative, not just human relatives, carrying the divine feminine is that threat, is threatened. And this is a really important piece, and I'm going to do my best to try and convey this. What that report carries forward is a, is a really important work. Another document that's being shared is a report by Nishin, the Native Youth Sexual Health ne Network, which is a group coming out of Toronto. And it was primarily two-spirit people who created this report, where they're talking about violence on the land and violence on our bodies. And the work that they did there was picked up again by the MMIW 2S Plus report. What they're really trying to convey is that the desecration of the land to, to, to eradicate the sacred and our sacred connections, <clears throat> the violence on the land, the divine feminine earth mother, that violence is mirrored in the violence on all of our relatives carrying the divine feminine. From the dairy cow to the egg laying chicken, to our indigenous women, to our, I can just keep, keep going, but I, I don't want to be, <clears throat> I don't need to bang this over the head. What I'm really just trying to convey is that the relationship to the land is inseparable and the way that we relate to the land and all the relatives on the land is inseparable from what is happening to indigenous peoples <clears throat> all over this planet. So cultural genocide can only be addressed when indigenous peoples are allowed to self-determine. And if we want to be able to address ecocide and cultural genocide, then we are having to recognize the importance of recentering those indigenous voices, not doing anything for them. Any work that you're doing, if you've already come so far along, just like that teaching I was giving about picking up the stone or the feather, and maybe you've already got it in your room, you didn't know about honorable harvest, it's never too late to just pause where you're at in your work and begin writing relations. <clears throat> it will become more and more critical. But the truth is, this is work we needed to be doing yesterday. This is work we needed to do 20 years ago. This is work that we need to do. Yo, thank you for sharing that, sharing those links. This is work that we need to do to assure that the coming faces, those, those in a generation from now and those in seven generations, that seven generation teaching, it, it cannot be taken for granted. It's at the heart of indigenous land stewardship is that everything we do, that regenerative reciprocity is also for the future. It's for those coming faces so that they too can have the occasion to know what ceremonial sema or ceremonial tobacco looks like so that they too can know what it feels like to hold an eagle feather so that they too can know what it looks like to see more than one variety of fish in our rivers so that they can know all the relatives that we, we've known and then some. I want to share this. <clears throat> I think I'm going to do another time check. Okay. I think that I have to wrap up really soon. So we have time to have some question and answer. But I wanted to share this piece, which is that we have a belief that in the ground and in the waters, that in the elements around us, that there are roots and seeds, that there, there is still the spirit of relatives that are waiting to return. And it might be easier to imagine that in the plant world, that there are seeds and roots just waiting for the soil pH and for the right organic matter that they may burgeon yet again. And that if we do the work <coughs> to heal within ourselves the impacts of colonization and to reconnect to the land that we are upon, wherever we may be, that not reconnect suggests that, in, that we can connect to where we are because the land it's, it's here and it's holding us. And what is here from that like little quote unquote weed that's growing in the cracks of pavement in the back alleys, and which is so often referred to as a symbol of resilience and resurgence, that it is an inspiration for good reason because the natural world or the wild world, it wants to be, it wants to exist and it wants to 
exist. The spirit of wild wants to exist within us too. And I think <clears throat> that my last piece is just going to be actually to bring us to this present time, which is the impact of COVID. And that COVID has had again, disproportionate impact on Indigenous peoples, of course, not just, also on Black and racialized peoples in general, that our racialized communities have because of systemic racism and impoverishment, they are, there is a war on the poor from the right, and that it is easier, it seems, to just... I have, I have been working uh, with Indigenous community, like streets involved Indigenous community, shelter using Indigenous community. And I also want to destigmatize because from a colonial perspective, they are seen as being uh, a subjugated, a subjugate, with being within a subjugated experience. Though for a lot of community, they feel actually closer to the land by being street involved and shelter using. They also have a freedom of movement in those ways. And it's another way of decolonizing the way that we think about community. The fact of the matter is they, they are being impacted in terms of mental health, in terms of actually the phenomenon of survivor grief, because it's not the first time Indigenous people are faced with an epidemic that is devastating their lives. <clears throat> I wanted to share just this one last thing, which is an image. It's the, the other thing that I, the other link that I shared, which it says something about High Park. So Parkdale is the dale of the park. That's what I like to say. Uh, High Park Parkdale is an electoral ward. In a lot of ways, there are linkages between them, and yet there is this invisible wall, which is primarily one of class and class privilege. Um, I didn't speak too much to the work that I do, but some of the work that I've been really centering in with elders and faith keepers is in and around High Park. So this is just a little, a little demonstration about placemaking. It's a, it's a concept that is to make space. Um, my faith keeper, Catherine Tomorrow, says we should really be thinking about place keeping versus place making because, of course, we've always been here. We haven't gone anywhere, so we're not making it anew. We're just trying to keep it and make it visible. So High Park is actually, for anyone who didn't know, the sacred ancestral lands for Indigenous peoples. Uh, there are bones of Onkwe people there and many ceremonies that have been happening for hundreds of years. It's also central to this concept of Toronto or Dando as a meeting place, that the peoples came here to meet for trade and for ceremony, among the things. So I just wanted to point out that in High Park, you can see in purple, we have baseball, diamonds, soccer fields, and tennis courts. On the western side, there's not one, not two, not but three tennis courts, and there's even more. And each one of those terrains has three or more actual courts in it on any given court, you can have max four people playing. So that's a lot of space for an individual and their tennis balls. Just gonna let that land. In yellow, those are all the off-leash dog areas. Red, that's parking. So those are spaces for cars. Blue, those are areas and that's by no means all the areas where Phragmites are. And Phragmites is a relative that in Hyde Park there, they see Phragmites as a noxious invasive and they wanna burn it. They want to bury it and they want to dump glyphosate. They've been dumping what is known as a cancerous or a, a carcinogen uh, for 20 plus years in High Park, contaminating the water and the soil. And from what I've seen in the past 20 years to no real effect. The point that I want to make though is that dogs, tennis balls, cars, and even this invasive, so-called invasive relative has more space than any indigenous nation of people. Because in High Park, there is not a single space that is held for indigenous people, whilst it's actually one of our oldest and most sacred lands. Mind you, you may be able to see along the side of the park, there are roads such as Algonquin Ave, and there is also Indian Valley Crescent, there's also Indian Trail Road, there's also Wendigo Way, Indian Road, Indian Grove, and Indian Grove Crescent. On all sides of the park, there are roads that suggest that commemorate an Indigenous history, and yet the park itself is completely sanitized and whitewashed of Indigenous presence or visibility. I'm just going to leave it at that, because I think that it raises enough questions too. Um, I think what else? I think 
I think I'm going to put it to the question and answer period now. Thank you so much, Joas. I think um, it was such a great learning experience to just share space and really just take the opportunity to take in all that you mentioned. Um, I think, you know, just the rewilding part was really uh, moving for me personally. I think as we speak, the people of my land in the rooftop of the world in Tibet, the mm -hmm. nomads are being constantly displaced into uh, concrete structures and really hit me because that's a statistic I know and I've been talking about when in my advocacy sort of realms, but the concept of really separating the humans from the wild, um, yeah, it hit me. So thank you so much again. Uh, <laughs> throughout the conversation, we also had, I believe, Peter and Opal who are also adding a lot of um, knowledge and insight in our chat. So I want to thank them uh, for adding their knowledge and insight. And I also want to take some time to open up the space right now for Q&A, but I also want to be intentional in creating some space specifically for our um, the advisory committee members. So we have had uh, seven folks in particular who are resident leaders on our, uh, in Perkto that we've um, recognized and have been part of this process a little bit longer. So if folks would like to have um, the space to ask any questions. That includes uh, uh, Sonam and Shoba, who are who've been accessing the art translator. Hi. Um, so Tongla, please, if they have any questions or any comments that they'd like to add, we want to make the space for uh, our our advisory committee members, and then we also have um, the rest of the participants who have joined us today. Uh, if you have any questions, please do raise your hand or uh, ad address your question in the chat, and we'll be happy to. Uh, thing. Address it. I want to call on the members of our advisory committee like Diki, uh, Ko, Naomi, Opal, Sonam, Shoba, Hi, uh, this is a call. Um, can I start? Please go ahead, Ko. Yes. Thank you so much, Jos. Um, actually, uh, while listening to your presentation, I was really moved and uh, it's hard to even breathe right now. But thank you so much for sharing your hist ancestors' history and uh, uh, your thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I'm interested in indigenous plant and how you use those plants as a medicine. So I wanted to learn, but I don't know any good learning materials, materials right now. So if you have any suggestion, then please uh, let us know. Thank mm. you. Make sure I'm unmuted. That's a great question. And um, admittedly, un and unfortunately, there aren't many publications by Indigenous peoples yet. Um, though I shouldn't say there aren't any, there are some. Um, there are there are books that have been published published by settler folks that are containing Indigenous knowledge about uh, plant medicines and their uses. Um, I can I can share a list off the top of my head. I feel actually again to recommend Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is her name is listed. Uh, she wrote that book, Braiding Sweetgrass, and I think that there is there is a certain amount of plant medicine knowledge there. Um, but she also just she is a great doorway into how to be in right relations with plants and indigenous knowledge. Thank you for sharing that, Heather. Um, but I can for sure actually draft up a list of some books that I have that are, because I think it is really important to, to support indigenous knowledge producers with their plant knowledge. 
Um, it's just that, in fact, many of our medicine people, um, like many of our faith keepers, are not public about their knowledge. Um, they're very protective about that knowledge and for good reasons. So to learn it, you have to develop relationships with those medicine people themselves and start going out on medicine walks and things like that. So um, ho hopefully that answers the question. I definitely think that any place that you can start with Indigenous community, uh, start relationships with local Indigenous community. And I think on Vivian Recollect, who is in Parkdale, who has a little medicine garden, some plants that I myself brought to that space. Um, that's a handful of medicines, but even strawberry, for example, and I'm thinking of strawberry because I brought um, strawberries to her garden over at uh, the Queen West Health Center. Um, even starting with one plant, strawberry is the, we consider the leader of the berries and berries are so important to indigenous peoples. And there are many berries that still are on the land, but are sparse and many that used to be here. Um, if you start to do some research around indigenous knowledge around the strawberry and the medicine of the strawberry, it'll start to open up more, you know, pathways to knowledge. I think too on tobacco, and this is something that I, when I'm working with indigenous community and they want to learn more about our plant medicines, I say, start with that tobacco, start with learning because it's a decolonial process. Like strawberries today, they're ginormous and they've been genetically modified with like fish and pigs. Um, and they're like covered in chemicals. And that's a very different fruit than the wild growing strawberry, which is tiny, but packed full of flavor and nutrition. So trying to decolonize the food systems is really important and to re-indigenize the connections that we had to them. So I brought up tobacco because we consider it our first sacred medicine. And, and yet it's been so colonized. It's been taken from our people and again, uh, manufactured into, it's been cultivated into a layer of like 7,000 plus chemicals on any, you know, cigarette that a person might buy. Manufactured cigarettes are very, very far away from our sacred plant. So even just doing research, connecting to indigenous elders or indigenous community, and little by little asking questions about that plant is really also a really good doorway to learning more about our plant medicines. Thank you very much. Yeah, all Thank the best. You. Thank you. Thank you. Ko, Ko is actually from Japan and she brings a lot of knowledge on um, how to recycle uh, the complex system of recycling that actually exists in Japan. And she mentioned in our advisory committee of how she would like to implement and start uh, bringing that knowledge from her ancestors here into Toronto Parkdale as well. So that's something that we're looking forward to. Um, I'd also like to invite Sonam who also had a question. Tell if you could translate for us, that would be great. Okay. <clears throat> Sonam, as well as uh, Shoba, both of them would like to thank Joe for having given us such a wonderful, wonderful, dear, it's more or less like a teaching for us because we have lots and lots of similarities between your culture and our culture. Likewise, your religion and our religion. And we do also believe in the five elements of earth, water, sun, air, space, everything. And you have the same thing. And this seems to be like reminding us about our own culture and religion and our faith. And the, with that, we felt so happy to listen to you. And it was so interesting. Would like to thank you so much, so much. And then lastly, we do have a question as someone already asked, but we would like to once again ask you that you do have some um, medicinal, indigenous medic medicinal plants, and we are very much interested in, the, uh, in this topic, just because of the fact that we do have the Tibetan medicines, the herbal or the Ayurvedic type, and we have lots of lots of medicines for different illnesses. And likewise, we would like to ask you, do you have any physicians who would prepare these or who would give treatment for different illnesses through these uh, indigenous plants being used? Could you please let us know? Great question. Also, thank you, Chimigwich Nalagua, for sharing your, your, your appreciation and your great spirits. It's so nice to see you all, your eyes. <laughs> um, 
you know, because it comes up a second time, and I have this teaching that if something comes up three times, um, but because there are three of you plus co, that's four. So that, for example, if someone said to me, I like your hat three times and I already have a relationship with them, I would give them my hat. So um, and perhaps it's worth considering that we might have some time together to exchange about medicine work. I would love to bring folks into, I'll let you translate. Thank you. you know, you know, with Greenest City, we have already for two growing seasons now been planting and growing some of our medicines, and we are hoping to be growing more. And I would love to be able to share and to figure out whether or not we have the same COVID protocols for next growing season to share knowledge about those medicines and to, to also, I would love to learn in that regenerative reciprocity about your medicine knowledge, ways that you would honor the plants and how you would prepare them, et cetera. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I look forward to it. <laughs> thank you so much for the wonderful exchange. Uh, I just want to also bring some attention to the chat. There was, um, I believe, Mark, who was also asking about uh, Sima. Um, and um, they have asked, maybe I can actually invite the uh, invite Mark into the space and ask them to ask their own question. If not, then I'm happy to read. Hi. I just wondered if you could explain the term SEMA. You used it a number of times. Mm. Or SEMA or SEMA? Yeah. So I think it's something to do with tobacco, but could you um, give the descriptive, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so in Anishinaabe Moen, that's the language of Anishinaabe people. So I was saying earlier how, you know, the English and the French referred to, or used the terms Iroquois or Iroquois to refer to Onkoyoma people. That's what we called ourselves. The Six Nations, which are a distinct six, they call themselves the Haudenosaunee. <clears throat> Anishinaabe peoples, they're, they're a different nation of people. They speak a different language. In English, they say they're the Algonquian peoples. And there are people who are called Algonquin, but that's not what they called themselves. They called themselves the Anishinaabe. So for Anishinaabe people, Sema or Asema is the word for tobacco. In Onkwemenea, we, we call it Oyengwa Umwe. But I just more commonly, because I am so surrounded by Anishinaabe peoples here, refer to tobacco as Asema. And it's kind of, and I give this teaching to kiddos, like this plant was growing here and it was called the Sema, Sema, Sema for so many generations. And then some folks mm. came across in big boats and they started calling it something else, like calling it Bob. And eventually mm. Asema came to know that it, it was being referred to, but it, it reverberates or it resonates in a particular way when we refer to it in that traditional language. And it helps me also to distinguish it from tobacco as a manufactured plant, which is very far removed. And it, it, to me, it's similar to that corn that is all the same very narrow strain of like a white corn that's been genetically modified and full of chemicals. That is the Virginia tobacco of manufactured cigarettes where our semi is very different. Wild tobacco looks very different from cultivated or conventional tobacco, just as our wild corn or our wilder corn looks very different than content, like manufactured corn. Thank you for that question. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Um, a lot of folks in the chat have also uh, expressed their gratitude and um, many thanks and appreciation for the exchange and your generosity of sharing your knowledge. Um, 
with the members that asked the question earlier. Uh, I also want to say again, thanks, uh, many thanks to Opal and Peter who are constantly filling our chat box with much more knowledge and backup information for, with links. Um, there's a follow-up question from Anupa. Maybe I can ask Anupa to unmute and ask their question. Hi there, thank you so, so much um, for sharing all of uh, this knowledge and all of these resources as well um, to encourage everyone to um, go on their own explorations. Um, my question, and I, I, it's great because it's kind of come up in uh, the questions so far, um, but I guess I'm, I'm curious about how it fits into kind of um, a larger process of kind of understanding, which is um, where or if the ancestral practices and traditions of migrants um, from formerly, who are, you know, who, who, who comprise people from formerly colonized nations can fit into everything that you're describing here in terms of writing relations and developing relationships with um, indigenous people and, and the land here. I guess in the, the political project um, as a tool of building solidarities. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. That's a great question. That's a really good question, Miigwech, for asking. Um, I want to say firstly that I have in my, in my lived experience, but especially in choosing to work with Toronto's urban indigenous peoples, um, where we're able to work on the land is in you know, parks and green spaces. And there's a lot of entitlement to those spaces um, by non-Indigenous peoples. Um, but the entitlement I'm speaking to is certainly by the more privileged, like upwardly mobile, um, class accessing white folks who don't, you know, who don't feel comfortable for any number of reasons with seeing Indigenous people doing even yeah, even smudging. Like I often talk about how you know we're we're, we're asked just a little bit more um, day by day to do things like share a smudge and share a song, or share a song and a dance because that looks and feels nice, and people think um, you know they're they're fulfilling the truth and reconciliation action items by doing that. And my email is full of people from churches and other institutions who are asking me to come for a one-off. Uh, to, you know, to hand over my medicines or, uh, again, teachings and, and not even necessarily offer to even, you know, tobacco or to resource myself or Indigenous community in any other way. Um, and the longer that folks have been, have had ancestors in the so-called nation state of Canada, those people who call themselves Canadians, like I, when, you, when asked, you know, what are your ancestors? And they say, you know, I'm Canadian. I've been here for five generations or whatever they are really hard to talk to about the, the depth to which colonization and the colonial mindset has, has, has owning their hearts and their minds. And their uh, sense of entitlement to these lands is just so intense. And it's really hard actually to, to talk then about cultural genocide and to talk about the impacts of indigenous people because they've whole, wholesale accepted and adopted the stereotypes because those stereotypes make them not have to absolve them of a responsibility for capital gain or capital wealth that their families have, have gained over these generations um, or just, yeah, for genocide. So to that point, um, I have found that folks who are closer, co closer connected to their homelands, who carry that, what I would call a heartache, an empathy, that is that pulling of their heart threads to their homelands, um, that they are, their spirits, like, I don't know how else to put this, but light up more easily, more readily when witnessing the opportunity to have relationalities with Indigenous folks. That's been my experience and that I have seen from across various organizations from the Canadian Roots Exchange or, I don't know, I'm just thinking of different organizations that are trying to do nation to nation, you know, relationship work or, again, reconciliation work, that it's primarily folks who are newer to this so-called nation state of Canada who are who are questioning the authority of this nation state, who are questioning colonization. And that's already just actually so tremendously 
powerful when it comes to actual relationship forming you know of course you can go to institutions but they're all funded by the state and in in so are often still harmful to indigenous people uh from dotum kanonsha or you know INAC, the indigenous northern affairs la 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 um, I think that in your your own in, like neighborhoods, wherever you can connect to indigenous people on the ground is going to be the most meaningful. Of course, knowing that there's good reason why people are a little bit protective or might not trust right off the bat. But largely, I find actually like for young across like all age groups and in indigenous communities across all nations, folks just want to be seen. They just want to be recognized as, as human people, just as anyone else. And that that generosity of spirit is the truly important thing. Our politics aside, like I have shared enough space with folks who call themselves allies and they say, I've read this and I've been up to this panel, blah, blah, blah. And they give themselves a badge and they believe they know everything. But we also don't need uh, more folks to tell us how to do things. Tell us, you know, they read this book so they understand us. We need accomplices. We need folks who are willing to, you know, go pick up our elders to make sure that our elders can get to our ceremonies, who are willing to do support childcare, who are willing to make some food at our gatherings and our ceremonies, who are willing to share space with us in those ways to resource us so that in this effort, I don't know if you've heard about Land Back, but it's a it's a more recent um, kind of cry mm-hmm. from this community. Uh, to be able to protect land and also to sustain our people is to have access to more land. But just throwing land at people is not going to be enough. We need to be resourced to be able to actually tend to that land. And to do that in right relations requires, again, making a lot of space to listen to Indigenous folks. And so hopefully that, that gives a little bit of insight. I think, you know, I often refer to calling people at home, you know, because I've had the experience again of having some like white cisgendered settler dude be like, I know everything about truth and reconciliation. And and I was like, so who, what elder, you know, what faith keeper, what knowledge keeper condones your behavior? Give me one name. Give me one name. And if you don't got one, go back to the drawing board, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have, I believe, Lee. Lee has a question. Maybe I can ask Lee to please unmute and ask. Thank you to Crows for all of your amazing knowledge. Um, I work with the Mutual Aid Network through Parkdale People's Economy. And um, we have been talking a lot about trying to um, like not only bring more indigenous people into the mutual aid um, idea, but or um, network, but to like really have the people in the mutual aid network understand this, so that we understand the land, so that we understand, um, so that we understand ourselves, um, so we understand, you know. Um, uh, the relationship between us and nature. Um, I heard that there was a group of indigenous group that is based in High Park, and I see your placekeeping map. <laughs> I'm wondering if you know anything about this indigenous group that's doing medicine walks in High Park, and is it true? And do you know anything about that group? What can you tell me? I'm <laughs> really interested and I'm interested in uh, like if those medicine walks happen in different seasons. Um, yeah, is it closed? Is it just for indigenous folks? Um, and all of the questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Problem. I'm just gonna, I don't wanna miss any of this. So I'm gonna make a few notes. Okay. Um, yes. Um, it's true. There is, uh, there are, there are, have been some, an array, actually, I'll just say this, just to acknowledge the place keeping that because of those, um, the sacredness. So for example, there's like 50 some mounds in High Park that are, some of them are burial mounds. Some of them are just ceremonial mounds. Um, 
a landscape full of mounds would would have been equivalent to like we didn't have GPS and street signs. We had oral telling that was very descriptive of topography or the geography of a place. So. Uh, part of the reason why High Park was central to that meeting place is that peoples coming from across the waters, coming from across the Kichigami Great Lakes or the various rivers and their tributaries would know that they were looking for a specific geographical place where the water comes in in this way and where all these mounds were to be found. Um, another such place was what is now called Toronto Island, but which, which was actually a peninsula. And I've heard a story accounting that the peninsula sort of pointed to High Park. So depending on the season and what were the ceremonies, and this is you know, a much greater thing to uncover is of course the 13 moons and how every full moon or every moon had different harvests and different ceremonies, which are still ceremonies still being put through. And this is the point I wanted to make is that, hi, my cat's trying to get my attention. Uh, the ceremonies are still being put through. They're just happening under the radar. They've been happening under the veil of darkness or just, you know, out of sight from the public because of essentially coming under attack for doing those ceremonies. I have myself been literally thrown out of the park by white settler folks who just did not understand that I was actually honoring the land uh, by putting out a feast plate. And that ignorance is, you know, is, is really harmful because it limits people's willingness to be visible in the, in the work that they're doing. But I want to name a Diagon Historical Preservation Society Diagon is the Onkwenwe name for a village that was buried now underneath what is called Baby or Babby Point, which is where Jane and Annette meet. There's a gate, the gate there, and in fact, it is a gated community. Uh, the peoples, there are said to be over 5,000 Onkwenwe people. It's a lot of people, but it was actually, um, though it was primarily Seneca, Wendat, and Mohawk, there were many nations of peoples that anybody, even if you're a Cree, you could come into a longhouse village as long as you bathe yourself in that wild ginger and you practice the great law of peace which is to lay your weapons down um and that's a specific site because those people were slaughtered and mass graves are and their sacred items are kind of you know strewn throughout people's basements in that uh, fairly affluent neighborhood um and that group again Diagon historical preservation society or tips thps have been around for several decades trying to restory those sacred sites. There's another sacred mound uh, on the river, there's another one in Scarborough, but specifically High Park again has 50 plus. So we've been doing ceremonies to feast those ancestors, seasonal ceremonies. Um, and we've also been trying to protect and advocate. So uh, about 15 years ago, there was an issue with um, BMX bikers digging up one of our sacred mounds, the Serpent Mound. And so indigenous community had a camp and a sort of, you know, um, a standoff, so to speak. Um, thankfully, it was not physically violent. It was definitely verbally violent. And a lot of racism came up uh, from the neighboring communities and from counselors and park staff. Uh, and myself, I've been with that group for five years now, going to meetings, regularly trying to represent Indigenous voice, trying to get resource, trying to get supported. And to date, we have still continuously been left out of any, you know, um, print material or online material that would name Indigenous presence or name us as a group that people could learn more about Indigenous history there. It's pretty egregious, actually. Um, it's been a little over a year now that a second group has come into existence, which is called the Indigenous Land Stewardship Circle, though originally we we're the Sovereignty Circle, and it's kind of, we're not sure whether we are the Sovereignty or the Stewardship Circle. Um, and it's it's mixed Indigenous and settler ally accomplices. Um, I think that that group has gotten a lot more attention because there are settler uh, academics who have platform and who are able to get more, a lot more <laughs> a platform than we have been able to historically. But TIPS, um, which is my, again, myself and two seated faith keepers, which is like actually pretty significant to have even one seated faith keeper in a group in Toronto. Um, we, we sit in that circle and that circle convened in and around the strategic burns uh, what they're called, they're called strategic burns, which has to do with maintaining the Black Oak Savanna, which is a very rare uh, ecosystem on the planet. And the Black Oak Savanna used to stretch clear across these lands. 
Uh, and it's a landscape which could not have existed without the influence of indigenous peoples. Um, there's so much more that I could say about that. Um, the circle was convened around trying to include indigenous people to have a bit of ceremony or something in the strategic burn. When we reached out, they promptly canceled the burn and they've canceled it twice now. Um, but we have since also been advocating around glyphosate use and we've done a number of ceremonies and actions and artworks like community artworks in the park. Uh, we have no like formal space um, or formal recognition, but we partner with the High Park Nature Center. They let us meet when we were meeting uh, in their spaces and they have sort of essentially allowed us and I say that with air, I'll say that with air quotes, allowed us um, to grow uh, some of our tribal foods, um, namely Three Sisters and some of our medicines. It's another space that we're working on placekeeping and trying to connect more, not just Indigenous communities. So with the Nature Center, we have been doing various programs. We did a year of full moon programming that was open to all. It was nation to nation. We'd have a feast, we'd share songs, we'd share teachings, we'd do artwork, we'd do nature walks. Uh, it was pretty awesome. Um, COVID really impacted our ability to keep doing that work but we did do a, a few medicine walks namely I led a few medicine walks so I would be more than happy to talk more with yourself or any of you folks about medicine walks and reconnecting and breaking down that invisible wall between High Park and Parkdale because what I really want to say is that there's actually a lot of Indigenous community in Parkdale and there's always been Indigenous community in Parkdale because of its like location to the lake shore to Hyde Park and the Humber River watershed. Maybe I'll leave it at that for now, just so I don't talk and talk and talk and talk. I don't know. Hello? Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, just to be in cognizant of time, uh, yeah. maybe we can allow for one last question if we have any, and then we can um, transition into sort of closing our learning session today. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to raise a hand or let us know in the chat that you have a question. I'll give it a couple of seconds. I feel like folks are already starting to say thank yous. So maybe- yeah. I could ask a question whether or not people answer it, but I just would like to leave this question with you. To, to meditate on, to reflect on tonight and coming days and for the rest of your life, ideally, which is what can rewilding look like for you in your day to day? Ah, that's my question. Rewilding. How can we get to it? Get back to it. Wow, thank you can so much. I, oh, can I try to answer? Sure. Yeah. I don't, well, maybe it's not rewilding directly, but what comes to mind is food growing everywhere. So domestic, I mean, plants that we planted, agriculturally or wild plants, but I'm visualizing what you're asking in terms of everywhere you go, whether it's in the city or the countryside or in the suburb, there's food growing in people's yards or in parks. Uh, there's all these open spaces everywhere that are just, like you said, Kentucky bluegrass lawns. And there's just massive, enormous spaces and there's no food there. Yo, what do you say? I feel to say I'm going to restory this real quick, which is I wasn't sure if I should bring up food security much more, but I wanted to share something about food security and indigenous land sovereignty based on this, what you've just shared. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, there are a lot of foods that people perceive as being European, such as tomatoes. Oh, they're so deeply associated with Italian cuisine, and yet Italians never saw tomatoes until colonizers came to these lands. And the original wild tomato was just a tiny little thing. But from years of solid ceremony and honoring of that relative, indigenous peoples created 
this this voluptuous tomato, potatoes, corn, beans, and squash, obviously wild rice, so many foods, actually eggplant, peppers, like so many foods that are just broccoli. And this like, there used to be like 600 different kinds of broccoli. But thanks to monoculture, we really only know one. And likewise with corn, there used to be hundreds, if not thousands of different kinds of corn. But now we mainly only know one strain of a yellow corn. And it's not because that yellow corn is more nutritious for us or easier to grow or healthier for the land. It's food politics. And I think on white rice and white wheat, these white foods that are, they're not more nutritious because they're white. We don't need to be bleaching wheat. It's food politics. Something about puritanical notions, what have you. Anyways, go on a tangent just to say that actually protecting tribal seeds and supporting indigenous people to not just repatriate, not just get the seeds back to the people, but to bring the seeds back to the land, which is to rematriate them and to do so with ceremony is one of the most critically urgent things that we can do here on these lands and anywhere on this planet is to support indigenous people to grow their foods. Because corn is a grass and any other grass that you could compare to, which is, you know, rice is a grass, wheat is a grass, etc. Corn is many, so many times more voluptuous than any other grass. And we believe strongly that has to do with the amount of ceremony, the singing, the dancing, the honoring for that relative. So that relative has given back in regenerative reciprocity for having been so well honored. And feed is the number one food source on the planet today. And just that's food for thought to think about how we can support indigenous food, so-called heritage food, getting back onto the land, just as you said, everywhere and anywhere we can, not just on the horizontal surfaces, but the vertical surfaces too. Wow, thank you so much, Joss. I think, um, Maybe we'll take the opportunity to say thank you for coming and uh, sharing so much with us today. I think all of us um, learn a lot. There's a lot for us to also unlearn and grow um, and reflect. Um, thank you for the question as well that you left with us um, to meditate and think of on. Uh, one thing that uh, one of our advisory committee members also reminded me to share was both of us share ancestry in uh, a certain region called Kongbo in Tibet. And uh, in actually in our language, yo means actually yes or agree as well. Oh. So every time you're speaking and saying yo, we're like, yeah, we say yo too to our grandparents. Um, so, so many similarities. And thank you so much to Miigwech tremendously. Uh, and then maybe I could take the last two minutes to quickly give you folks um, some updates. So next session that we will be hosting that will be um, our final learning session, but definitely not the last of our project because that is just the beginning, uh, would be our Climate Justice Circle hosted on Tuesday, December 15th at again 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also scan the QR code that is attached in the below of the graphic uh, from your phones to register. If not, um, there's a bit.ly website and uh, we invite every single person that has joined us today and from our other learning sessions to come out and um, really envision with us. This will be an open circle where all of us would have the opportunity to reflect on what this means for Parkdale and how we wanna move forward from here. Um, thank you so much again. And I would also like to take the last minute to ask any community members, um, oh, first of all, yeah, <laughs> all of uh, the folks that joined us today, if you could please, Click the link or scan the QR code to give us feedback on our session today. 